Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to the Bendigo Seventh-day Adventist live stream. And I am joining you here from Swan Hill, um, which is about as close as I can get to escaping from Victoria at the moment. Um, Victoria is currently a, uh, what, what would they call it, a leper colony? Um, that's right. No one, no one's allowed to come in. No one's allowed to go out. So we're a bit isolated. But here online, we're all part of one big family. And I have with me today, uh, Danny. Uh, Danny, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from? Oh, hello, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is uh, Danny Peña, and I'm currently in Mayagüez, Puerto Rico, where it is Friday night. So you guys are in the future, right? You guys are going to tell me what's going to happen today. But um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I currently, I actually, with Jason, we spent several years in South Korea working as missionary English teachers with SDA. And uh, right now, I am working as an English professor in Antillian Adventist University here in, in my OS. And uh, my BA is in, is in theology. And, and I love it. I love it. And it's my pleasure to be here sharing with my brethren from Australia. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. Really, really happy. So God bless everyone. Great to be here. Great. It's great to have you, Danny. And um well, maybe just to begin with, uh, let's have a prayer together, and then I'll ask you to do a bit of a mission story. Maybe that could be uh, your whole life story. I don't know. Whatever you want to share, and maybe you can relate to the Sabbath School lesson for this week, because we're going to be talking about something a little different uh, for most of the time. But uh, let's let's have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that we can be here together, um, even though uh, we're so far apart. Um, I thank you that we can be together in, in voice and on video and in spirit. Lord, I pray that you would bless us, that you would uh, bring us closer to, to you from the things that we discussed today, and that you would draw us always nearer to Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, Danny. Well, do you want to share something with us? Certainly, certainly. Um, well, some people ask me, like, why, why did you study theology if you never wanted to be a pastor? Well, the thing is that I love theology. It fascinates me, especially Adventist theology. It's beautiful, the spirit of prophecy, you know, the lesser light. I mean, like, how much more truth can we have? And so um, I wanted to be the actual, actually, I wanted to be the pastor's right-hand man at my local church. That was kind of like my, my goal. Oh, an evangelist, right? Um, and so, uh, but having worked in SDA, we were in South Korea, my wife and I, for 10 years. We got married in 2005. We graduated in 2000, May of 2006. And in uh, September uh, of that year, we were in, in South Korea. So having, having that, that missionary English teacher experience really shaped my, my approach or my view of evangelism because SDA primarily focused on friendship ministry, right? We would teach the students English because first and foremost, it was a business and money was exchanged for services. So we would teach English but then on the weekends, we would invite the students to come to conversation clubs and music club. And then Sabbath morning, we had worship and some other um, English, English proficiency classes. But the content was all spiritual. And so I, I saw this method and, and, and I was really taken by it because it's literally friendship ministry. Like, how, how do you find out about good things? You, people tell you, be like, oh, man, I'm doing this or I'm doing that or I bought this product and it's working really well for me. And then you try it and then you get hooked, you know. And so it's the same with, you know, ministry and, and evangelism. And I really like the story of the Gadarean, right? Uh, I, I'm going to have to apologize, you know, side note. You know, my whole database is in Spanish. So I, I, I translate. So, so if something comes out kind of weird. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> yeah, Spanish is probably closer to the original Greek than, than English is anyway. Um, I think I see Mandla here. Mandla, how you doing? Oh. Hey, guys. How you doing? I'm well. Thanks hey. very much. Hey, Daniel. Hey. hey. Greetings, greetings. Nice to meet Daniel you. Daniel and Daniel today. Yes. In Spanish, when somebody has the same name, we say tocayo. Tocayo. So tocayo is that you, means... You're tocayo? 
Yeah, yeah, my tocayo. Or I could just relate to you, like, tocayo. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, Daniel, um, where are you from? Are you from America or, or Mexico or Spa Spain? I don't know. That's a really good question. Actually, I'm a mutt. I don't know if you guys know what a mutt is, but I'm a, I'm a mixed breed. <laughs> my, mother, my mother is from Mexico, and my father was from the Dominican Republic. And they met in Chicago, and they got married there. So I was born and raised in Chicago in a Hispanic church, <laughs> raised in the American education system, but yeah. having multiple identities. <laughs> <laughs> so I would imagine you love to dance, isn't it? Pardon me? I said, I would imagine you love to dance. Uh, it's in the blood, you know? It, yeah. it's in the blood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, um, so, to, to, to so uh -huh. yeah. So, Danny, you keep going about your mission, mission story, about your your life ah, and mission. Yeah. And so, so yeah. like the Danarians, um, like my whole experience led me to this one truth that it's our experience. At the end of the day, what people are interested in is what can I tell them about my experience with God? You know, because for me, that's the remedy for the Bible thumping. That's the remedy for, you know, taking spirit of prophecy and using it to, to bash people over the head with. It's just tell people what God has done for you. The end, the end. And if I'm in error, if I'm in error or another person knows more than myself in love, kindly share what God has done for me and the light that I've, I've received, but never am I going to be like, brother, you're going to burn in hell if you keep on that. At no, man, it's my influence. I'm telling people what God did for me. And yeah, so ultimately, I, I really enjoyed this week's lesson because it's pretty much that key point. And then it also touched on if we receive a no, you know, if somebody's just like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not interested. Well, it happened to, to Mary Magdalene and, and these, these ladies, you know, the disciples didn't believe them, believe, believe them. So, you know, sometimes we're going to receive a no, but we just got to be persistent. And I don't mean in your face Christianity, like, brother, how was your morning worship with the Lord? You know, it's just like, man, I feel good today. Why do you feel good, man? Because I prayed, you know, I prayed last week about the situation and then this happened. And man, I feel so good because I feel close to God. Oh, and then the other person's gonna be like, oh, okay. But you sowed a seed. And it's the Holy Spirit's work to water and grow that seed. But you did your part, we did our part. We just shared what Christ did for us. And, and yeah, that, that whole experience with you know Korea and you know my background in, cause I come from a relatively conservative background where everything was wrong, everything was bad. And, you know, the Sabbath, oh, my goodness, guard the fringes of the Sabbath and it everything. Nah, man, God has really, really opened me up as to what the Sabbath is all about, you know, and what evangelism is about. And so, yeah, so there it is. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for sharing, Danny. Yeah, or Doya, Doya, was that, was that what I'm supposed to call you? <laughs> my my double. Tocayo, Tocayo. Do, sorry, what was it again? <laughs> Tokayo. 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 Okay. Tokayo. 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 Okay. I'm learning. I'm Tokayo. learning Spanish, so I'll I'll be able to be, understand the the street signs in heaven. So that'll be good. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I, we've got some comments here. Maybe uh, maybe Jason, who's um, hiding somewhere um, behind the scenes, could you put some of the comments up and we'll, we'll read them and uh, say hello to some people? Yeah. Uh, Darren Greaves says, Happy Sabbath from Coral and Darren in the Bendigo Church. I think um, probably quite a lot of people didn't didn't come today because uh, it's been a bit cold, but they're watching online, which is fantastic. Jim says, Good morning all. Thanks, God, for the great rain we had last night. I would like to add to that, Jim. Okay. Thank God that I managed to get here through that rain, uh, despite the fact that I, on the way up here, it's uh, it's two hours from Bendigo to Swan Hill, and I had a uh, 
a run in with a hailstorm on the way. So uh, it was threatening to break the windscreen, but it didn't. It didn't. So praise God that we, we got here um, just in time to start the stream. Kwame says, happy Sabbath. G'day, Kwame. Uh, thank you so much for saying hello. And Alison, good morning and blessed Sabbath all. Yeah. Now, Alison has the distinction of having been the first person to like this stream. She liked it when I first uh, created it uh, four hours ago or three hours ago, something like that. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't liked it yet, give it a like and that will help your friends to be able to see what you're doing today. Darren says, happy Sabbath from Darren and Michelle. G'day, Darren, and hope you had a good holiday. Um, glad you made it through, uh, through Melbourne. No, that's not on my end. So I'm just I'm just being a bit cautious here that uh, I don't end up creating an echo because I'm sitting here in Swan Hill Church and we actually have, uh, I've got this headset that I'm speaking and hearing through, but we actually have the live stream going through the church itself. Um, so if, if there is an echo, that's probably my fault now. So... It was on my end. So... Um, I'll pass it across to you guys and let you say something more about um, mission very quickly before we go into our Sabbath school lesson. Right. Um, can you hear, can you guys hear me? Okay. So, um, mission. Mission is the sole purpose. It is the sole mission of this church we have been called to bring others into the fellowship of god into the fellowship of the ministry of the holy spirit and of the son now oftentimes we um we sometimes get lost along the way with regards to what our focus should be you know but if we continue to look at the example of jesus if we continue to look at the life that he lived and we understand that it was mission-centered, everything that we do as a church, everything that we do as individual members of that church needs to be geared towards mission. Winning souls, that is our sole and only responsibility. And when we focus on that, everything else will start to make sense. Family life will start to make sense. Marriages will become strong in the church because mission focuses on families. Our societies and our communities will be free of crime, free of drugs, free of anything that might corrupt because mission focuses on a holistic approach of building the individual into a solid disciple for Christ. And so mission definitely, it is the lifeblood of our church. Amen. Thank you, Mandla. Um, Let's just go into a time of singing now, and uh, it's we're going to have a pre-recorded special item, but sing along to it. We'll all mute our mics uh, so that we don't get yeah. weird things going on. Um, but it's going to be hymn 152, I believe, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Um, so we'll get that up now. Rise on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard, the verse. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they nailed him. Tell how he liveth again. 
loving the story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love, pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Well, thank you for singing with us. I'm going to ask you a question now and I want you to answer the question if you can for me. I'm going to put the question up on the screen and um, it's going to be this one. Let me see how this works. Oh, yep, there it is. So the, the question is, how has society changed from 1900 to 2020? How has society changed from 1900 to to 2020. Now, you could say it's only changed a little. You could say it's changed a lot. You could say it's changed in these particular ways. I want to I want to see what you've got to say on this topic because this is something that I think will inform our conversation when we discuss some of the things that I've prepared um, for us to look at um, on the Christian conscience and our place in society and in the world and with government and things like that. So. Um, Send in those answers if you've got them. But I'm going to turn, first of all, to the Bible. And we'll just look at Proverbs 24, verse 11. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 24, verse 11. Now, you might be surprised to think of Proverbs as a place where we would talk about conscience. Isn't, isn't Proverbs all about being smart? But Proverbs has a lot of moral teaching to give us as well. Um, and Proverbs 24, verse 11, the Bible reads, Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. So the Bible's teaching us here that it's not just good enough uh, for us to say, well, you know, it wasn't my business that that person was suffering or that person was uh, was dying. It's our business to go and to try to help that person. Now, The first application of that, of course, is like what we were talking about, right? Mission, reaching people for Jesus, bringing people to Jesus. But I think there might be more to it than that. What do you guys think? Well, in in my case, uh, definitely. Uh, Addressing the question, uh, how has society changed? Well, in the 1900s, for example, Things weren't so prepackaged. They weren't so processed. Information wasn't processed. You know, just like, you know, we had to, I don't want to say we had to, because I don't think any of us were around back then, but, you know, uh, people had to prepare their meals, grow their food and things like that, and and really, you know, make things happen in the same way with information and things like that in the gospel. People read, people compared text with text, you know? William Miller's Bible, you know, and his concordance back and forth, text and here and there. And, you know, but nowadays everything is just so prepackaged and, and processed and, and, and convenient that it affects us in, in, in many different ways. Now, um, the question that you posed was, you know, how, how is it that this text goes beyond, you know, just uh, leading people from death? Uh, for example, the, the health message in and of itself is a way of saving people. It's, it's an angle. There are different angles. That, that's that's how, what I would, I would say. There are different angles, right, to approach saving someone from death, right? For example, somebody will not hear. They hear the word Jesus and they lock up. They hear the word church and they don't want to hear it. But you talk about, you know, how being leaving meats you know flesh foods how it can uh, uh, improve the quality of your life how certain herbs are integrating certain vegetables 
can give you more energy. And many people are more open to, to, to that, which will lead them ultimately to Christ, you know, because the spirit will work. But I think the angles, the, we have more ways to approach saving people from, from death. That, that's, that, those are my thoughts. Cool. Thanks, Danny. Manda, you want to make a comment? Well, um, <clears throat> starting with the with the question of how has society changed from the 1900s? I think mm. um, well, I don't think we have evidence in society mm. that um, we've had massive uh, positive changes. For instance, in the issues to do with with race issues to do with social classes, um, issues to do with women and women's rights, children, rights to education, war. We have come a long way as a society in ensuring that there is um, equality, in ensuring that there is a level playing field. Um, can we do more as a society today? Definitely we can. We can always improve because we are you know, in a sinful world. However, to, to, to pretend that no positive movements have been done from the 1900s to the 2000s would be, um, would, be, would be evil, to say the least. It would be unkind, it would be uncalled for to say that. Society has come a long way. We've also had some negative, um, negative changes. It all depends with how you look at it. Um, technology has progressed you know, to extent where information is readily available. And that is a positive and that is a negative in and of itself. Um, the church, which, um, you know, just prior to the 1900s, uh, you know, was largely the Catholic church and was viewed in a very negative sense because of, you know, the crusade and what was happening during that period. We noticed that in the 2000s today, you know, the view of the church is different. We also noticed that people were more spiritual back then. It was easier to approach people with the concept and the ideas of a deity, of a divine being, a divine intelligence that created than it is now. People are more um, inclined to believe, uh, or rather to not believe. They believe that there is nothing, which is believing in itself but people believe that there is nothing. So the, the positive and negative changes that have happened in society. Now, with regards to the text, and also with regards to the changes that have happened, um, the text from the NIV, you know, like you say, rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards mortar. It's an active verse. It's, it's a verb, it is describing activity this is something that we must do we, we should not be on the sidelines watching whilst those who are going to death probably unjustly so those who are going to death and we just watch and comment on the sidelines and do nothing about it you know god is expecting us to be actively involved in our communities in ensuring fairness in ensuring justice, in ensuring judgment um, to all people, regardless of whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you are uh, good or you're bad, in quote, the Lord wants us to stand up for what is just and what is good. Amen. So maybe if we could add a new dimension to this discussion, how do these two things interact? How does our conscience and our wish to help people practically in in society and um as individuals and like you were talking about danny as as a friend how does that interact with our our mission which is our priority like you said mandla uh yeah. to want to bring people to jesus because sometimes those two things can be a, a bit at odds can't they what, what are your thoughts about that um yeah definitely um one of the, um, Paul uh, was addressing an issue of meat sacrificed to idols. And for some, it was an issue. But for those that had a greater understanding, they, it, 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 it wasn't an issue. But 
because it was an issue for those that didn't have the same light, the more mature Christians, so to speak, they were just like, okay, if you think it's bad, then I'll, I'll refrain from it. Even though I know there's nothing wrong with it, but you know what, for your salvation's sake, I'll do it, you know? And, you know, hmm. when we, when we are trying to benefit our communities. Okay, wait. I have a friend uh, on Facebook. He, he, he's said to be an Adventist historian. And he's been off of Facebook for a long time, but he's gotten on recently and he's posted things like Black Lives Matter is, it has a Marxist agenda. And, you know, the people behind it have a specific agenda. And, but, but I, I, don't, I don't see it like that at all. I grew up, you know, in the hood, so to speak. I grew up, you know, I'm a minority in the, in the US, I'm a minority, you know? And so black folk, Hispanics, we're in the same boat, you know? And our histories, you know, they're intertwined, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm half Dominican, which means I'm half black and and a portion a portion European and a portion you know Native Dominican. I'm also part Mexican, so I, there's the, so it's just like we're all in the same boat. And so what I see in society is I see people mistreated. I don't care how you want to spin it. I see black people being harassed and stopped by police. Videos, I see videos. They are not resisting. They are standing with their hands behind their backs and police come and body slam them. Police come and put their, their, their forearm or their knee on their necks and stuff like that. I don't care. I don't, I don't see videos of, and, and forgive if I'm not politically correct, I don't see white folks having those problems. In my upbringing, I didn't. If I had a white friend, I felt safer than if I was with my with my friends, which were usually Hispanic and black folk. And you know, and and we would take certain precautions, and we wouldn't go in certain places because we knew police would were more prone to stop us. So, so for me, for me, I don't know if I've gone off topic. <laughs> black Black Lives Matter. No. Okay. Yes, I remember how why I got on this tangent because yeah. my friend is saying that. If you're kind of a friend to Black Lives Matter, you're kind of subscribing to this Marxist agenda. And but but it's like, no, I want to help my brethren. Even though I'm not going through this, you know, if I see injustice, I'm gonna try to speak out. I'm gonna record, I'm gonna be like, officer, please, you know, I'm gonna try to intervene because that's my brother, that's my sister. And um and so in doing so, I believe that I am being like Christ. I am doing, you know, his work and I am trying to help out and I am trying to show, you know, God's love for humanity by trying to help my brother, my brethren. And so, um, yeah, conscience, my conscience mm. moves me to do that. Mm. I can't yeah. sit right by and be like, well, if I speak out, then I'm a gay. So let me just hang back. No, oh, man, if I see it, if I see somebody harassing, actually, you want to know something sad? I've already prepped myself. That if I'm speaking Spanish in the States, like when I visit Chicago to my family, I've already prepped myself that if somebody harasses me for speaking Spanish, what I'm going to do? I'm going to start singing, you know, Almighty for the world. I was going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Come thou fount of every blessing. <laughs> really, really loud. <laughs> you know, because, you know, I don't want to engage. I don't want to be involved in that. And, you know, to my heart to sing. Like, yes, my conscience drives to act, to intervene, to help my brother. And um, as long as I'm, as long as I can stand before God in my personal worship and have nothing to be ashamed about, I'm good. I'm good. You know, and if I'm wrong, God's going to be sure to let me know. I don't know if I addressed the question. If I. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. Sorry. I just wasn't sure if I was muted there for a second. So um, this is good, Danny. Thanks for sharing. Because I know there's a lot of people have been feeling this way. And I, I think it's something that we need to talk about. And maybe we'll we'll talk a bit more about this. So, I wanna 
I want to take you to a passage because a bit of a context here is that um, a lot of people have said for a long time that as a church, we are apolitical. We, we don't get involved in politics. And one of the reasons for that was because of the Civil War, right? In the American Civil War, uh, the Adventists didn't, didn't fight in that, in that war, right? But I want to show you a, a, a section in First Testimonies, first volume of the Testimonies, um, page 363. And it actually explains the reason why they weren't involved in the war, because it might surprise you. Right. Let me, I'll read it for you. So it's in the first volume of the Testimonies by, by Ellen White, uh, page 363. If there were union in the Northern Army, this rebellion would soon cease. Rebels know they have sympathizers all through the Northern Army. The pages of history are growing darker and still darker. Loyal men who have had no sympathy with the rebellion or with slavery, which has caused it, have been imposed upon. Their influence has helped place in authority men to whose principles they were opposed. So what Ellen White is saying is that the reason that they didn't want to get involved in the war was not because they didn't believe in the cause. They did believe in the cause and they were willing to, to help fund the war, which they did. Uh, but what they were not willing to do was to put their lives of their young men at risk because Ellen White knew, and I don't know how she knew this. I don't know if this was generally known. I assume it wasn't. Um, but we know now from history that this was true. Ellen White knew that the generals in the Union Army, that is the North, the side that was supposed to be against slavery, many of them were actually sympathetic with the South and they wanted the South to win. Well, not necessarily to win a clean victory, but at least to get a negotiated peace so that slavery could be preserved and then, and the union could also be preserved. That was actually what most of the generals in the North wanted. We now know that um, from history. So the issue wasn't with the cause. The issue was with the vehicle which the cause was being promulgated through. And it wasn't until the declaration of what was it called, the universal emancipation. Maybe, uh, Danny, you can, you're no, maybe more familiar with, with that. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation, Proclamation, that's the one. It wasn't until that that Ellen White said, now we, now we completely support the war and what's, being, what's happening. And it was soon after that that the war was won. So perhaps God also supported it from that point onwards as well. So I just wanted to raise this because I think it's a, it's a good example of how we've misunderstood our past and why we've been keeping out of certain things and it's ended up causing us to learn the wrong lessons from history. Uh, yeah. For example, during the Second World War uh, in Germany, the Seventh-day Adventist church leadership in Germany did the same as almost every other church, and they went along with Hitler, you know. And obviously that's inexcusable, obviously. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to be very smart to, to get that, right? And yet they did it because they said we were just staying out of politics. We were just, we didn't want, our ministry to be compromised um, by our point of view that was not not acceptable, and so it's we really have to take it more seriously than just say, "Well, we'll just stay out of the whole thing." But I do think there's that lesson that Ellen White has that even if there is a good cause, a worthy cause, you've got to be really careful tying yourself to the reputation and the actions of a movement that is for a good cause. Even yeah. if that causes abolishing slavery, even if that cause is, is, for example, abolishing alcohol, which was a cause that Ellen White herself came very close to actually becoming associated with. She was a major speaker for the temperance movement. But when she spoke, she was always pointing people to God and pointing people to their relationship with God and their need for honoring God in their lives. She wasn't saying she wasn't talking about legislation. Do you, do you see the difference? So I, I think it's it's an issue that we need to talk about because we've had a certain view of what we as a church believe that isn't necessarily based on accurate history. And I think we just need to rethink it a little bit. Um, now, yeah. I'm sorry, but there's been a lot of comments put up on the screen. Yeah. Um, can we read through some of those before we before I give you guys a chance to respond? Is that 
Is that cool? Yeah, nice that. Um, all right. So we had a happy Sabbath. I know it's from Sonia Joshua. So thank you for saying hello, uh, Sonia. And Jim says society in 1900 was much more parochial and family based. Parochial. I like that word. So that's the idea of very local, right? Um, people were more connected to religious ethics and life was simple and family focused. In 2020, we are technology focused. Well, as you see, right? Uh, more self-orientated, distracted, and less community-minded. Mm. Yeah, that's that's it's hard to put a good spin on that, but there are some good sides to it as well, being more connected and stuff. Robert yeah. Robinson says, society seems to be less united and supporting than it used to be, or perhaps I'm just getting to be more cranky in old age. Uh, Robbie, that's humble of you, but I think you might be right um, as an old man myself. Darren says, in 1900, to have faith was commonplace. Now, I like you put faith there in inverted commas um, because maybe it wasn't always genuine, but it was commonplace and encouraged or expected. In 2020, to have faith is old-fashioned and not keeping up with the times. Sadly, I think that's true. <laughs> we, faith doesn't get a lot of respect these days, does it? But in reality, everyone has to have faith in something. It's just some of us are more honest about it and open than others. Maria from Swan Hill originally, um, but now moved elsewhere. Um, so those in Swan Hill, maybe you recognize her. Didn't Ellen White have a vision that some of the sons in those in the congregation where she was told would die in the war? That's right. She did. And that was all a part of her broader um, agenda. That, that is to say that the agenda that God gave her, which was to keep Adventist young men out of that war, and it was absolutely the right strategy. In in place of sending men, they were allowed to give money instead, and that's what they did. They went to a lot of effort to raise money, which in absolute terms probably was just as effective for the war effort as having sent the men would have been. But something that we've learned from history is that those men that did sign up, thinking that they were going to be serving you know, God and country, Many, many, many of them, many of them were simply thrown away by generals who actually didn't want them to win. They wanted them to just die and then the North would negotiate a peace with the South. So that's right. Jim says, I believe that vision is correct. And it was. And, and those young men, I think, did join despite the warning and um, they did die. So there was, a, there was a whole complex ecosystem, you could say, if that's not too pretentious, um, of reasons why our church stayed out of that conflict. It was not as simple as one uh, one thing that we can point to and say, therefore, we should never be involved in any politics under any circumstances, because that's simply contradicted by the fact that the early Adventists were major abolition advocates um, yeah. of, you know, they were a major part of that cause. So... Um, Mandla, did you wanna you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to uh, bring out the idea that there is um, the idea that there is Black Lives Matter as an organisation, yeah, and then there's the statement Black Lives Matter as a statement of truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in similar fashion, we understand that our pioneers were in the forefront of abolishing slavery. Does it mean that they supported all the policies, all the uh, things that were being promoted by the governments of the time? No, but they understood that slavery in and of itself is bad and it needs to be fought against. Now, we need to understand something that the, the issue of Black Lives Matter, the statement has been taken and formed into an organization, but the statement itself remains true. Black people's lives do matter. And in saying that, in saying black people's lives matter, we're not saying that white people's lives don't matter or Indian people's lives don't matter or anybody else's life doesn't matter. That's not what we're saying at all. So, so. In, 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 fighting for, in fighting for the rights of any minority, we are fighting for the rights of all majority. If we can obtain justice for one person, we have obtained justice 
for all people. Remember that when um, evil always prospers when good men do nothing. So you need to understand that if, if nothing is done against injustice, against one person, then that injustice will continue to everybody. And we need to remember that the governments, the governments today are not under the control of God. They are not. So this injustice that we see against minorities, the, the grand plan is to have that injustice against all people. And it is our responsibility to fight that. Remember when we had the Me Too movement, women were coming across and saying, look, we are being sexually abused by men in authority so we can progress in our careers. Now, whether you believe in feminism or not is not the point. The point is women were being abused and they had to give themselves over sexually to gain anything or to advance their careers. Now, that is wrong. I don't care if you believe in, 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 in uh, feminism or not. If you have a girl child, you need to protect her from that. And to protect her from that, you need to stand up against any practices that ensure that our children can be abused. So you don't have to be in the Black Lives Matter organization. You don't have to promote Black Lives Matter material. But if you see injustice against people of minority, it is your responsibility to speak out against it. That's the point. And, and I'd like to add, and, and that's spot on. And one of the issues that we have today, and you touched on it, is that, oh, by saying that Black Lives Matter, we're, we're, we're saying that all lives don't matter. And, and that's, not, that's not the message. But many people try to spin things according to fit their narrative, you know? And um, if we analyze US history, recent history, like people, I saw this on, on, on Facebook, that the, the I, I don't remember her name, but the young black student who, who was the first student to desegregate a school, a lot of the young people that were there booing and hissing are still alive today. So that, that, that view or that idea or concept that people of a different color are less still exists among society. And I don't, I don't wanna get too deep into this pool, but the laws of the land to an extent favor a specific group. And so, but what I really like what Mandela said, the distinction between black lives matter that these people need our support and need our intervention because, you know, they're being, they're being killed versus what it's evolved and become Black Lives Matter as a movement with an agenda making demands. So I think it, it, we need to be very clear that I must help my brother. At the end of the day, I must help my brother, I must help my sister because that's what Christ did. Shave away everything, pull everything off. And what is the core? Love for one another. Love because my God is love. And those that love know God. Those that don't love don't know God because God is love. So love needs to push me and drive me to, to speak out for, 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 the, for the widow. <laughs> <laughs> for the what, what were the examples that Jesus used? La, la uh, viuda. Like, yes, the the it went for, anyway, these people that were marginalized by society, the Bible Old Testament clearly states you gotta speak up for those people. Now, what's changed from then to now that the orphan can be understood or or the 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 widow can be understood to be those that are marginalized by society. 
So we got to help them out. We got to look out for them. And yeah, I just wanted to add that to Mandela because it was spot on. Thanks, Danny. So uh, we got a comment from Jim as well along a, maybe a similar line. He says, I believe our church is too silent on many of these social justice issues. Our silence is as good as supporting those unjust practices. Now, this actually brings me to another quote that I wanted to read for you. And I haven't got an actual physical book with this quote in it, but I, I found it on the internet. And um, it's quite a famous quote in our church because it's the one that's used uh, against this the most. Let me just put up the quote for you. Um, so that's the reference. Now I'm just going to read a short section from from that from that bigger section, and this is how it goes. We cannot, with safety, vote for political parties, for we do not know who we are voting for. Now, in a democracy, now I'm, I'm not everyone lives in a democracy, but in a democracy, if there is one basic thing that you can do to create social change or whatever it is that, you know, for society, it would be voting, right? Um, now, sometimes we might feel that it doesn't really make any difference, but if you automatically say, no, I'm not going to vote ever, you're basically saying you're not going to have any influence ever. So this always sort of niggled me a little bit that, that this quote was there, that Ellen White had said this. But what if you actually look at the whole context of the letter? First of all, who is it addressed to? Nobody knows who it's addressed to, but I'll tell you, right? It says, to the teachers and managers of our schools. So is this addressed to everybody? No. No, no it's not. That doesn't mean that the principle doesn't apply, you know, I'm sure the principle applies universally, but the point is this is a specific letter in a specific context. Next, what is the next thing it says, right? It says, we cannot labor to please men who will use their influence to repress religious liberty and set in operation oppressive measures to lead or compel their fellow men to keep Sunday as the Sabbath. That's not the exact next sentence. It's just a couple of sentences later, but it, it flows from that same idea. So this is not saying you can't vote um, at all. This is saying you shouldn't vote for someone that's trying to bring in a Sunday law. <laughs> Now, now, why on earth would any Adventist be voting for someone wanting to bring in a Sunday law, right? You would wonder, right? And um, I looked up the date of this letter. It was, it was in 1899, so just the year before 1900, and I looked up the election in the year 1900. And it was between William McKinley, the Republican, who ended up winning by a landslide, and William Jennings Bryan, a Democrat, who was also a Christian populist, who is only famous today for having been the one that tried to abolish evolution in schools. Now, it's interesting that um, we as a church obviously don't believe in evolution, whereas most churches do now, but obviously this guy was a very Christian guy. You know, he was someone that was promoting Christianity, and I think perhaps a lot of Adventists like that, right? Wouldn't you like to have a person running for president that seems to be a good Christian person? Um, that'd be a nice change, wouldn't it? Right. Um, so it seems from the letter that these teachers were telling the kids that they should, you know, they should all try to support this Christian guy that was running for election. And Ellen White saying, "No, you shouldn't. You know, it doesn't matter." And this is this is here's another quote, and this reminds me of something that one of you guys was saying as well. It says here, but the world is governed by principles of dishonesty and injustice. So what Ellen White's saying is that even a Christian president or whatever is still going to be governing from principles of dishonesty and injustice. Now, that's not to say that we can't try to make things better. Ellen White herself did that, right, with the abolition of slavery and um, the attempt to uh, abolish alcohol and so on. But the point is, we can't trust someone, no matter how good they may seem, if they are saying that what they're going to do is something that's clearly against religious freedom, right? It, there's, you can't vote for someone. It's like, oh, this person's going to make Christianity great again or something, you know? Well, make America great again, fine. But don't, don't you tell me you're going to make, you know, bring religion back because that's exactly the kind of thing that we are trying to avoid, right? And, and Ellen White is actually 
being a political activist here, isn't she? She's actually saying we shouldn't support someone that's promoting a certain kind of idea. Now, back in 1900, like, like we were saying, it, everybody more or less was Christian, right? So it, it, it made sense politically to push Christianity as an agenda, right? But today, that's obviously not the case. But maybe it'll change. Who knows, right? We don't, we don't know what we don't know what the future holds. It's very easy to to look in our little narrow slice of what we've experienced and think that it represents the whole of of what will happen in history. But no, you know, revivals happen. Things change, and I I pray and I hope there will be a revival. And may we be part of that revival. May we not separate ourselves away from that revival because we think, oh, but we don't. That's that's political. You know, we don't want to be involved in that. Who cares? But we've got to remember that we retain our own identity. We retain our own independence, that we're not going to be dominated by some other group, no matter how good they may seem, that we sell ourselves and our beliefs out. And, and Dan, um, I think we also need to, uh, both you, Dan, actually, and everyone else watching, I think we need to understand that um, it is our responsibility to resist the spread and infestation of evil. It is our responsibility. Imagine mm -hmm. if someone was passing the Sunday law. It is our responsibility. Ellen White says we ought to resist it until the last breath. We should not be, you know, we should not be a people who are quick to accept laws that will hinder the spread of the gospel. But like Jim saying, in, 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 in our silence, we support those very laws. So we, we, we cannot be silent. And this is not just about and this is not just about racism. It's about everything. We, we cannot be silent about everything because when we become silent, we are giving the devil a foothold. And by doing that, we are making our own work of mission harder. Yeah, and, and adding to that, I'm piggybacking on a lot of your ideas, Mandela. <laughs> um, it, it, it brings it, you know, it boils it down to when I walk with Christ, I cannot be silent. When I, when I spend time with Christ, my heart bleeds for the person who's being marginalized and I'm moved. <laughs> to do something, you know? And, and I think that as, as Adventist people, some, sometimes we conform or we're happy with theology. The Pharisees loved them some theology. They took it to the next level. But interestingly enough, those were the, that was the group that most clashed with Christ because Christ was in the front lines. He was in the trenches with the people. He was lifting up the people. He was showing true love, true interest. He wasn't judging from a distance. You know, he was there with them and supporting them. Their victories were his victories. And, and so I think when we have a day, a, a morning, you know, prayer life, an evening prayer life, you know, where it, it nourishes our soul. When we read the Bible, not so that I can quote and be like, well, this is right, this is wrong. When I read it so that my soul is nourished, then I'm going to be a totally different person out there than if I'm trying to convert people with theology. Because that's what a lot of people that I know Rather than befriend the person, they're going to come at you like, hey, brother, how are you? So um, what church do you attend? Or are you interested in learning? No, ask that person what their name is. Ask them, you know, how can I help you? You know, like I'm, I'm with this church and we're trying to impact our community. We're trying to get to know our neighbors. And so we're doing a small survey of our needs. We're doing a needs analysis. And we want to know if you have any needs that we might be able to help you with. You know, and so so what you got? Do you, do you need help around the house? Do you, yeah, you know, actually, I, I got laid off and, and, you know, we're a little short on food. It's just like, all right, 
all right, you need some food. Okay, okay. Well, we have this, you know, this mission is called ADRA. And, you know, so I want you to come by on this day, or if you can't come, I'll bring it to you. And, and then and then we can talk a little bit then. How does that sound? Is that cool? All right, Ramon, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll contact you on this day at this time. I didn't say anything about the Bible. I was addressing my brother's needs. Now in the next conversation, you can bet <laughs> Then I'm gonna I'm gonna stick something in there and I'm gonna be like, so yeah, you know, we got this program where people donate and this and this and that, and and you know, we just love helping our community, you know. And and then from there, the more meetings you have, the more you meet with that person, conversations just gonna lead you to why are you doing this, man? I'll be like, because Christ did this for me, and that opens the door to sharing your experience, man. Or you could be like, man, I was in this situation and a person actually found me and they brought me some food. And so I'm a firm believer in this type of mission work. And, and I just want to do for you what Christ did for me, brother. I'm the really, that's, that's what I have. And the person's going to be like, wow, man. And over time, you're going to establish a report. You're going to establish a friendship. And then you make the invitation, brother, I want to invite you to my church, man. You know, I, yeah. I think you're really going to enjoy it. You know, there are a lot of people like this. and you know, I'll pick you up. How about that? Is that cool? Uh, I don't know. Uh, look, look. Have I have I mistreated you in any way? No, not at all, right? Well, imagine meeting a bunch of me's at a place. Do you think that would be cool? Yeah, I think that would be cool. All right, man, I'll pick you up and, and we'll roll up. And then that's evangelism. Be exciting. Before, before you speak, allow me to just say one thing, because I feel it needs to be said. Who are the marginalized? Because oftentimes when we're talking about this issue, people think that, oh, we're just talking about black people. Oh, black people suck. But we need to understand that the marginalized are not just minority races. The disabled are marginalized. Women are marginalized. Children are marginalized. The poor are marginalized. Old people are marginalized. And it's, it's all these people that we are having to fight for. We could, we could, we could easily say women's lives matter. We could easily slay disabled people matter. Would you then say, ah, oh, yeah, but able-bodied people matter too? It's it's ridiculous. So we're looking at we're looking at it from that perspective. That if we can stand up for and and like you say, uh, Daniel, if we can show love, if we can show kindness, if we can stand up, and like what the comments are showing as well, if we can stand up, if we can speak. And we can show support to the people who are downtrodden and oppressed in our societies. Our societies become safe places. The church becomes a safe place. And when the church becomes a safe place, it becomes a place where people can run to for support. And that's what we want. We want a, a church which can draw the community by its works and not only by its doctrine. Amen. I think I saw a comment there from Jim. Um, maybe we can get that back up again. You cannot be Christian and be silent. Those who were martyrs lifted up their voice and paid the price for it. Yeah. So we got to we got to speak about something. And I, I guess this is part of why I was wanting you to think about how has society changed since 1900 till 2020? You know, because the issues are different. And now, if you speak up about what the Bible teaches, you can actually, you know, get in trouble for it, as we've seen. So it's, yeah, it's it's tough. But let's let's read the Bible. We'll we'll bring the conversation to a close. But I'll get you guys back uh, again, you know, soon, so we can have another conversation. It's been fantastic talking together and uh, yeah. hearing all the different ideas. And thank you so much for those who shared the comments. It's great to have that that extra input as well. Let me read Jeremiah twenty nine, uh, verse seven, and there's a pretty well known verse, but it. It's something that we can reflect on as we think about bring it home, bring it home to us. What, what can we do right now? And uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 7, talking about a very, very unjust, very unjust government, very terrible situation. Um, Jeremiah 27, uh, 29, verse 7, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. And I think this is something that maybe sometimes we forget about. It's just so important that despite the fact that sometimes um, we're annoyed at our government or, you know, our 
the yeah. situation that we're in with our, our society. We need to pray first and foremost that God will preserve peace in our society um, because there's nothing that could happen worse to us than a chaos, anarchy, and, you know, everyone, every man for himself. You know, we, we need to be prepared for the possibility that may happen, but we don't want that to happen. That would be terrible. Uh, Vim, I saw a, a comment from Vimbai. Maybe I'll read that. A lot of people are silent about the things that make them uncomfortable. It's the same attitude with which we approach mission with. We can never reach the world in mission without standing up and meeting people at their point of need. Yeah, the old comfort zone, huh? That's right. You know, we, we get comfortable just living our life. Love needs to be stronger than comfort, I think. Doesn't it? Do you guys want to finish with a with a thought, and then we'll sing, uh, we'll sing him four nine three together. Um, one last thought before we hand it over to Mandla. Yeah, um, I think I like to keep things simple. I have to keep things simple for myself, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it comes down to having a love relationship with Christ. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Those that are going to be in heaven know Christ. They walk with Christ, you know, and they nourish that. They treasure that that time, just like a love relationship, you know. Ideally, you should know your spouse more after five years of marriage, and you should know them even better after 10, after 15, right? You know, this, this year, I mean, this month, we celebrate our 15th anniversary. And I never, and I never imagined, <laughs> I, first of all, I never imagined how fast time moves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm shocked at how much I can love, like, like not only my wife, my kids, like I never knew this much love <laughs> was possible. And, and I just, I can't. And I'm not trying to be, you know, sappy or anything, but I, I just never imagined that another person would impact my life the way this woman has. And I can't imagine, you know, any anything else. And so I compare that to Christ. I need and want to love Christ like that. That, look, man, I gave my wife a serenade, man. You know, when we were dating and I'm kind of shy in that in that aspect, but I did it for her, you know, and at the same time, I, I, I stepped out of my comfort zone out of love. That's my point. And it's the same with Christ. It's the same. It's just like, Master, you've done so much for me. You know, what what would you have me do for you? You know, I want to do something special for you. What can I do for you, my God? You know, if you ask me, I'll do it. I mean, if you tell me I will do it, if it's stepping out of my comfort zone, I don't care. I'll do it. Just, just be with me. And when we have that kind of devotional life, that kind of, uh, then it's going to move us. It's going to push us and drive us. Mm, Amen. Well, I just want to, um, in closing, I'll talk about a story, uh, something that happened um, just a couple of days ago. In fact, it was just two days ago. And um, we were just talking with a group of friends and we were talking about gender-based violence. And there was a video that we were sharing. Well, we're not sharing the video, but we, we were, someone had recorded a woman being brutalized by her husband. It was a very disturbing video. And so it was a group of friends, about six, seven friends all Christian friends as well. And as we were watching the video, it stirred up emotions in all of us. And one of my friends say, you know, use vulgarity against the husband and say, oh, this guy is, a, you know, and use, put any vulgar word you want to put there. That's kind of the word he used. And Everyone was generally in agreement, but there was one guy and he was like, ah, I don't think we, we need to be using that language. And the conversation turned from the, the abuse and the violence of this man to the fact that he was addressed using a, you know, 
a cuss word. But this is what was then troubling to the rest of the group because we started to ask him, so you're more concerned with the cuss word than with the violence against the woman. So what's my point? My point is coming back to what Daniel said. Sometimes we are so focused on the theology. Oh, we can't say these words. And we can't. I'm not saying we should. We can't say these words. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do that. But when big things are happening which affect society, we are quiet. We all should have been really uh, uh, worried about the woman and trying to find ways to help her if we knew her. But no, we ended up focusing on the fact that a cuss word was used as a response to that particular video. So this is what I'm challenging Christians today to think about. Whilst we focus on the little things of the gospel, Jesus says that you tithe salt and mint, and it's good to tithe those things, but you have forgotten the weightier things of the law, mercy, love, kindness, judgment. So as we do the little things of the law, let's not forget the weightier things of the law. Amen. Let's not be the kind of people who get so upset when someone comes to church late. But we are comfortable in our silence when the government is corrupt. So let's be a balanced people. That's all that I'm trying to say. Amen. Thanks, Mandla. And maybe, maybe Danny, you can say a prayer for us and for Mandla as he's going to speak. And after you've finished... Um, We'll sing uh, the hymn 493, um, and um, I think after that we'll just go straight to Mandler and he can he can preach, pray, and that'll be the end of the end of the stream. So, Danny, if you need to if you need to go somewhere or anything like that, thank you so much for joining us, Danny. Um, Let us pray. And I hope hope you have a great Sabbath tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Let us pray. Father God Almighty, we praise your holy name and we thank you so much, Lord, because you've given us so much light. You've given us the Holy Spirit, Lord. And it's exciting because Revelation 18 says that there's going to be an awakening. There's going to be a revival and there's going to be power. And just like at Pentecost, Lord, people are going to be converted and then the end will come and then you will come and then we're going to be done with all of this, Lord. And that's what we want. We want your kingdom to come and your will to be. So, Father God, as we face our struggles and our challenges, we pray for victory, Lord. We pray for your light to be made manifest in every one of our lives. And at this moment, we also want to uh, put Brother Mandla in your hands. We pray that your words flow through him, that he may be a clean vessel through which you can speak to your people. Thank you so much, God, because you have not abandoned us. You're here with us still, and you have a plan, and you, you're working things. Help us to not trip up your plans. Help us to stay close to you so that we know when to wait, we know when to speak, and we know when to be silent. Thank you so much, God. We love you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Amen. All right. Well, let's let's sing together. Um, Four ninety three. Fill my cup. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make it whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasure earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. 
Over to you, brother. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, just allow me to open my page. All right, my All right, we'll just have to work it out as we go. Um, happy Sabbath and good morning, church. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Wherever you're from, um, Australia, United States, I know we've had a couple of people watching us from as far as uh, Indonesia, Jamaica, and I want to welcome all of you um, to um, this live um, show. Uh, before I continue, we did have a few comments that I just wanted to read as well. One was from Kwame. He says, Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, if we can all practice that, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Thank you very much for that. Now, going into the sermon of the day, the title of the sermon is A Voice in a Time of, time of Trouble. And today I'll be talking about Micah. So please, if you have your Bibles, I will share a couple of the texts. I hope that you'll be able to keep up. Now, talking about Micah, Micah was a prophet from Moresheth, a little town in the southern parts of Judah. And Micah prophesied during the reign of kings Jotham, his son Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. According to the biblical account, we understand that King Jotham, if you read from 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 34, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. The so King Jotham was a king who did what God wanted him to do. He obeyed the commandments of God. He lived uprightly. He encouraged the people to follow the commandments of God. However, the Bible states he did not remove the high places and people continued to sacrifice and burn incense in the high places. So we understand that during the reign of King Jotham, the people were kind of worshiping God and kind of worshiping the heathen gods as well. People were kind of into Jehovah and kind of into Baal. People were kind of going to the temple, but still going to the olive gardens to worship the stars and the moon. This slackness, it continued to kindle the flames of apostasy in the people. And at the reign of King Jotham's son, who was King Ahaz, Israel totally backslid into the darkness of spiritual, social, and political darkness. There was nothing that was holding the people back except for the king. And when the king changed from King Jotham, a good king that feared God, that obeyed God, to King Ahaz, his son, who cared not for what God did, but walked in the ways of the kings of the land, when the kingship changed from one political system that feared God to another political system that did not fear God, the people backslid totally into a darkness that was both spiritual, social, and lastly, it was political. In 2 Kings 16 verses 3, we learn that King Ahaz did not walk in the way of the Lord, but rather he walked in the way of the corrupt kings of Israel. Some of the things he did, he made child sacrifices according to the abominations of the heathens. He took his own children and sacrificed them in the fires of Moloch. 
He sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. This was the nature of King Ahaz. It was during this great apostasy of God's people that God raised the prophets Isaiah and Micah. You see, Isaiah and Micah prophesied round about the same time. Isaiah prophesied during the reigns of King Uzziah, um, Ahaz, Jotham, and Hezekiah. And Micah prophesied during the reigns of King Ahaz, Jotham, and Hezekiah. Isaiah was a prophet of high office in the politics of Israel. He was a high-ranking official in government. And Micah was a mere civilian in a small town south of Judah. Now, the people during this time had been so swept away with evil and spiritual apostasy had given birth to social injustice. The social injustice was so repulsive and it was utterly reprehensible. In righteous anger, God said of Israel in Isaiah chapter 1 verses 4, the Lord says, Oh, you sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corrupt. This was the nature of society during the apostasy of King Ahaz. Israel had become politically corrupt, socially corrupt, spiritually corrupt. The family structure had been torn down. God said of this people, they are a sinful nation. There was not one who was good. A people laden with iniquity. All they thought about on their minds was sinfulness. In Micah, God actually says to Micah, Woe to him who lays on his bed conjuring up evil things to do. The people were always thinking of evil. They were corrupt. There was no equality in the land. There was no justice in the land. There was no righteousness in the land. There was only evil. See, the people turned a blind eye to the wickedness of the kings. No one wanted to speak against the wickedness of King Ahaz. But by the silence of the people, they eventually became participants in the abominations and the social injustices and the spiritual apostasy that had become normal to the king. And by their silence, they became participants in the evil and the apostasy of one king. You see, when we are silent against one injustice, it doesn't matter if that injustice is against a white person, a black person, an Asian person. It doesn't matter if that injustice is against women, against children, against the disabled. If we are silent against injustice, we become active participants with that injustice. When the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from the world, we will have strengthened in our characters wickedness and evil. And much like today, the political leaders, the kings, the prime ministers, the counselors, the pastors, the elders of today, we have rejected God. And the people, the civilians, you and I have likewise rejected God because we follow in their footsteps. We do nothing. Much like the days of Micah and Isaiah, the Lord continues to lament. He says, sinful nation, evildoers, corrupt children. This is God's lamentation on society. Our societies are riddled with evil, racism in white countries. But that's not all, xenophobia in other countries, tribalism in Africa and xenophobia. Corruption in politics, abuse of authority, social inequality, abject poverty, police brutality. The rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. The guilty are let loose by subversion of justice. And many times the innocent, the fatherless, the defenseless go on without restitution. Minorities continue to suffer. And so I am not only speaking against racism, I am speaking against xenophobia. 
I'm not only speaking against injustice in uh, judicial systems, I'm speaking against injustice even in our societies and even in our homes. I'm speaking for the innocent, the fatherless, the defenseless, those who do not have the money, those who do not have the resources to fight for them. The Bible says we need to speak up for them as well. Allow me to turn my page. And so it is amidst this background that Micah declared to the kings and people, turn your Bibles to Micah chapter 6 verses 7. It is, in, it is amidst this background of apostasy, this background of wickedness, this background of injustice, this background of nonchalance uh, with regards to what was happening, this background of spiritual apostasy and political indifference. It is against this background that in Micah 6 verses 7 to 8, God says, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In verses 8, he says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. All the sacrifices that we could give God mean nothing if we do not do what is just, if we do not love mercy, if we do not walk humbly with our God. All our church attendance is useless if we do not do justice, if we do not love mercy, and if we do not walk humbly with our God. Even if we were to give our firstborn for our transgressions, it would account for nothing. If we do not do justice, if we do not love mercy, and if we do not walk humbly, with God. Isaiah echoes the same thoughts to the kings and to the people in Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11. Going down to verses 15. The Lord asks the people, he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs, or he goats. The Lord continues in verses 12. When you come to me, when you come to appear before me, who has asked you to do this? Do not bring any vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity. Every solemn meeting is iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. This is God speaking to his people about their worship. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes. When you pray, I will not look. When you make your prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. Wash, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes and cease to do evil. And this is what God would have us do. Verses 17, it says, learn to do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. Our Sabbath keeping is an annoyance to God. If we do not seek judgment, if we do not relieve the oppressed, if we do not judge the fatherless and if we do not plead for the widow. Our tithes and offerings are an abomination to God because our hands are full of blood. And how are our hands full of blood? Because we keep silence when blood is being spilt. We do nothing when we see injustice. We are content to hide in our homes, to hide in our churches and do nothing. But God says, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Actively seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. Our church going is useless if the fatherless, the oppressed, and the widow find no one to plead their cause. Jesus in Matthew 5 verses 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The church cannot remain a silent spectator in the ills of the world we live today. 
The church was active in, in, in abolishing slavery. So the church must too today be active in abolishing social injustice. You and I cannot separate ourselves from our very real responsibility to uphold justice, judgment, and plead for the oppressed. It is not enough for us to only talk about it in our backyard, but never actually do anything about it. Jesus says the world must see our good works so as to glorify God. I am challenging the church today to be seen, to be felt in our communities, to stand up against oppression, to speak out against inequality, to actively promote peace, love, and unity in our communities. The leaders of the land must see in us, the church, the example of truth. That is our calling. I know this is a difficult subject, but everything I've said is from the Bible and God does not mince his words. Micah declares in Micah chapter 3 verses 9 and 10, listen to verses 9, 10, 11 and 12. Listen to what the Lord says in verses 9 of Micah chapter 3. He says, hear this, I pray you, you heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. He is speaking to the spiritual leaders. He is speaking to the political leaders, which are the princes of the house of Israel. And he says, you hate judgment and you pervert equity. They built up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof, they judge for reward. And the priests thereof, they teach for hire. The prophets divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is the Lord not amongst us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps. And the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. You see, if we do nothing, if we say nothing, if we care for nothing, if we stand up for nothing, the Lord declares that Zion, for our sake, will be plowed as a field and Jerusalem will become heaps. And we know that when Micah finished prophesying this, Israel went into captivity. Our churches will remain, our churches and communities will remain empty and bereft of any real spiritual and social growth if God's people continue to hide from their responsibility. I will share the last thing before I pray. In the book Education, page 56, Ellen White declares that the greatest want of the world is the want of men and obviously women, men and women who will not be bought or sold. My question is, where are these men and women? Where are they? She continues and says, men who in their inmost souls are honest and true. My question is, what use and value is your integrity if it is only known to you alone? If it does not serve your community, your integrity is useless. She continues and says, men who do not fear to call sin by its rightful name. There is sin and injustice all around. In Australia, in America, in Africa. Yet we do not call this sin by its rightful name. We are afraid to speak out. We are quick to strike members from the books for breaking the commandments. And yet we have nothing to say when our governments are corrupt, when our judicial systems are flawed. Is this not hypocrisy? She continues and says, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the poor. Are we true to our duty? Our duty is to be a light, yet we are so obscure. 
that we go on without anybody not noticing. In Bendigo, the community does not even know we exist because we are obscure. She continues and say, men who will stand for the right, though the heavens may fall. Will we fight for the right? Are we fighting for the right? Because this is our calling, church. This is who we are called to be. To stand up for the right, to fight for the right, though the heavens may fall. And throughout the Bible, Isaiah died for speaking against social injustice. Zechariah, Micah, Jesus says they killed the prophets because the prophets showed them their sins. Even Jesus died for pointing out the sins of the people, the sins of the nation. John the Baptist died for pointing out the sin of King Herod. Jesus says, whoever is to follow me must take up their cross. I'm not saying we are to be irresponsible. No. I'm not saying we are to sacrifice our lives irresponsibly. No. God does not. God does not delight in irresponsibility. What I am saying is, we do have a responsibility to be a true light and to stand up against injustice, to hold the Bible as our guide and to live according to it and to encourage others to live according to it and to encourage policy makers to live according to it. That is my calling. That is your calling. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Because we understand and we know, Father, that you love justice, you love judgment, you love equity, you love mercy and kindness and goodness. And you loved us so much, Father, that you gave Jesus, your son, to die on the cross for us. And you're asking us today, Father, that if we love you, we ought to give our comfort. We ought to sacrifice our comfort zones and work together with you in showing the world what the true gospel is and in calling many to you. Help us, Father, to not be afraid. Help us, Father, to speak out. Help us, Father, to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, church. Uh, thank you for listening. And I hope God blesses you. And, um, yeah, enjoy your week. And God bless you.